Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're coming together to continue reading on 4th Ezra. And uh, we're continuing, we're going to recap and do the same thing we read last week because we kind of went on a segue that we didn't share, which is nice, but we want to keep this together. So um, without further ado, we are on chapter 6 and the beginning of the third vision. And it came to pass after this that I wept again and fasted seven yamim in like manner in order to complete the week which he told me. And on the eighth day, or sorry, on the eighth night, my heart was troubled within me again, and I began to speak before Most High Yahuwah. For my ruach was greatly aroused, and my inner being was in distress. And I said, O Yahuwah, you who spoke at the beginning of the creation, and said on the first yom, let Shamayim and Eretz be made, and your word accomplish the work. And then the Ruach was hovering, and darkness and silence embraced everything. The sound of man's voice was not yet formed. Then you commanded that ray or that array of light come to the forth from your treasures so that your work might appear. So I find this rather interesting right here, but just to recap, on the first Yom, he created the highest Shamayim, the place where the throne of Yahuwah is and the Melakim, the messengers dwell. And then the earth and the waters. And because of the mundane bodies that were created, there was darkness yoked to the deep as it's written. And right here, he introduces light from his treasuries. This is um, recapped also in the recognitions of Clement, where it, it says it almost word for word what I'd mentioned. The, after the creation of these things, the mundane bodies caused shadows to be on the, the face of the deep. And then he introduced light. Um, I don't know how familiar you are, but there was a video that came out with the solar eclipse that happened over the United States of America a few years ago. It went in a line directly across it. Someone had had a hot air balloon with 360 degree camera, almost every different angle where you can zoom, you can go up, down, look around, and you can do like a 3D movie watching the eclipse. When people had filmed that, they were looking at the sun and they saw that it looked like there was a star that was tidally locked to it when it moved when the sun was moving it moved and it stayed in sync like the two were tethered together and it, it almost looked like it was a projector beam and the sun was the emanation of it it's rather interesting but it's kind of like what this is saying i can't prove that but it is something i've seen and it kind of goes with this right here But to continue, it says, Upon the second yom, you made the ruach of the firmament and commanded him to divide and to make a division between the waters, that the one part might go up and the other part remain beneath. Also, if you remember in the first yom, there is a separation between the light and between the darkness. And here in the second yom, you see another separation with the waters above and the waters below. These are reminiscent. In the first yom, he separated between the righteous and the wicked, and each had their own proper place according to their works and fruits. Cain and his children, Seth and his children, and it goes on like that. And on the second yom, the separating of the waters is commenced with the firmament. All those that were underneath died, and Noah and his children and posterity carried on to re-inhabit and colonize the world again. This is upon the third yom, you commanded the waters to be gathered together in the seventh part of the Eretz. One parts you've or one parts have you dried up and kept them to the intent 
that of these, some being planted of Yahuwah and tilled, might serve you. For as soon as your word went forth, the work was made. And immediately there was a great abundance of fruit, and a great variety for the taste, and flowers, and immutable color, and odors of wonderful inexpression, or inexpressible fragrances. And this was done the third yom. If you remember on the third yom, he divides the nations after the Tower of Babel, and then he gives his covenant, the promises to Abraham and Yitzhak and Yaakov. It's the work of his hand and, all, and what he's doing to make plentiful fruits and things like that. But this is what he describes in the parable of creation for the works that are actually being accomplished in history. And as we continue, Father willing, we'll see that more and more. Yeah, the third yom was with the, the table of nations, the splitting up into the places, the giving of the promises to Abraham, the resemblance of his children to what he said, and then teaching and learning. Like uh, the millennial reign, when there's obedience, there's esteem and everything's brought to perfection. But when there's disobedience, there's trouble and there's problems. And all of that has to do with lament to teach and learn. But that was the third yom. Upon the fourth yom, you commanded the brightness of the sun to shine and the moon to give her light, and the stars should come to be and all in order. And again, that was the bridegroom, or the one that's like the bridegroom is the sun, which is our Mashiach, the light of the world. The moon is like the Shemayim Yerushalayim, the, the heavenly, they call it, Yerushalayim, or the Malkuth Shemayim. And it was foreshadowed or showed to us in the, the rain on the land. Excuse me. When uh, the parable was given with the dream for Yahusuf, his father was the sun, his mother was the moon. And then you see in different parables later on in the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, the son was given to Louis, and he, he claimed it. And Yahuda, who was given the, the reign or the Malkuth, the earthly kingdom, you call it, but the, uh, the reign on the Eretz here, he took the moon in hand. And it was the moon that represents the reign by its full illumination and by its desolation it's for the nourishment and growth of all the living and it's meant to teach us these things that when men are obedient and the children of light were doing their the will of their maker there was full esteem to their what you can call mother as it was depicted in second baruch and other places talking about Jerusalem. um but when men were disobedient she's made desolate and that was meant for our nourishment and growth to teach us and to help us to do right and then the stars the children of light running the course set before them are the lights that are set up on the hill that are supposed to shine to those on, uh, all around them like our mashiach was giving the parables for and that's the fourth young it says and you gave them a charge to do service to man who was about to be made upon the fifth yom you commanded the seven parts where the waters were gathered together to bring forth living creatures, fowls, and fishes. And so it came to pass. For the, for the dumb water and without life brought forth living creatures at the commandment of you, Yahuwah, which if you know what his name means, yod heh wah it's literally he who causes it to be. that all people might declare and praise your wondrous works. Then did you ordain two living creatures, and the name of the one you called Behemoth, and the name of the other Leviathan. And you did separate one from the other, for the seven parts, namely, where the water was gathered together, could not hold them, could not hold them both. And to behemoth you gave one part, which was dried up on the third yom, 
to dwell in the same part where there are 1,000 mountains. Or it says 1,000 hills in another translation. But to Leviathan you gave the seven parts, namely the moist, and have kept him to be devoured by whom you desire and when you desire. Right, this one right here, the fifth yom, it mentions that Leviathan and Behemoth in the book of Yobelim were the first works of flesh made with his hands. But they're the last mentioned right here. And that's also a parallel. It's like the first works of flesh, but the last beast reigns to be established is how that turns out. The first will be last. Um, when you look at the, the meanings of these words, it's also significant. You know that the deep or the waters, the peoples and nations, languages, tribes, and tongues are equated to the waters or the moist. And Leviathan was the beast that came out of these seas. It all plays that same picture. But Behemoth is in the desert place or the dry wilderness, they call it. And it's the place where there's a thousand hills, which the beast out of the earth, they equated to America. That That's actually a quote. They had a poem about the the land of a, uh, you know, a thousand hills and from sea to shining, from sea to shining sea. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it's reminiscent of here as well. And then the um, the birds and the be or the birds and the, the beasts, right? The beasts out of the field came first. The living creatures, as they call it, and this would have been the non-domesticated cattle or the non-domesticated animals, right? All of them tip to find characteristics of men, but not necessarily walking correctly in relationship to our maker. This kind of comprehension is given in the epistle of Barnabas and in the letter of Aristides by the high Cohen when he's explaining the meaning behind the dietary laws and how it was meant to teach righteousness. If each of these unclean animals, they have characteristics that men should abominate and have nothing to do with in how they behave. But the fish, it's the same way, except those are without the breath of life. They're in what they call the abysso or the waters, which is like death. And the ones that are delivered or brought to the light are the ones that can reflect the light, and navigate the waters. They're taken, they lose their life, but they're, they're brought into the light. The idea is they're like Kepha was made fishers of men. The men that came to the truth during this time were martyrs, they died. So, and that's after our Mashiach came. There's a lot more involved in that. I'm just trying to give a quick summary of each one. And then as we go over the different ones, you'll, you'll see it again and again. But once you get this pattern, it's pretty, pretty easy to remember. Leviathan, before I go on, is Louis Natan, right? So or Louis, and then to give, it's the word for those unto me, and then the word for giving, or like Nathan's word, what you're going to get but it's if you remember louis was the kohen and when the kohenim went apostate it was like this leviathan and that is exactly what you see with catholicism behemoth has its own thing i haven't looked into this one too much so i can't say otherwise or else i would comment But if you remember the word for living creatures, the Bahama, the, the cattle, that's behemoth is similar in spelling, but it's made um, as a large land animal. All right, continuing here. Upon the sixth yom, you commanded the earth or Eretz to bring forth before you cattle beasts, and creeping things. And after these, Adam also, whom you made. And over these, you placed Adam as ruler over all the works which you had made. And from him, we have all come. 
and the people from whom you have chosen. All this I have spoken before you, Yahuwah, because you have said that it was for us that you created the firstborn world. All right. Before I move on right there, I wanted to finish this one. The sixth Yom, you see that he made it. It's the cattle, which lines up with the letter Reish. I told you that lines up with the Reformation. Or it's the symbol of those who praise, confess, and acknowledge Yahuwah and guard his commands. They're the ones that are domesticated and trained. And then the beasts, they're, um, they're the ones with the breath of life, but without the comprehension of a man. Some of them are clean, and some of them are unclean. You have lions and bears, but you also have deer and elk. So there's a distinction, and while some of them might seem wild, they're, not all of them are. And during this time, you had a lot of men that were acting in ways that were not appropriate. But then you had those ones that they seem like they're out there. The, the, they were sometimes flocked together, sometimes alone. The Wycliffs, the Tydale, the Hoos. That was during this time before the Reformation or the cattle where we had the people domesticated in, in congregations and large bodies together. But the response to after the beasts and then the cattle was the sheen, the creeping things, the creeping creatures. That has to do with the counter-reformation and the things that came about after that. The reason why these are all works of his hands and claimed, because if you remember, before the sun, moon, and stars, he did not claim the works of unrighteousness or any of these wicked things. But in these creatures, you see stuff that he had later called unclean. There's different distinctions that he separates for uses of men. However, it's all, it's all things that he's doing. And after he came in the fourth yom, he said, before I came, they had no sin. But now that I have come, they, there's no excuse for their sin. And it was after this time that things started to count. Also, after the time of Constantine, when if you're following along with those videos we've been watching, he brought in and made official by state sanction the Nicolaitan heresies that were usurping the belief. And it was from around 300 to 700 where they wiped out all the real believers, including the blood relations of our Mashiach and the emissaries. But... Um, Um, just one moment. I have to pause. All right. Sorry about that. So with, after he came, he is revealing and making known all these things and illuminating it. And it's also that it, his belief was considered universal. While Constantine brought in error, they put away the overt paganism throughout the empire. It was no longer to be practiced and there was a time where there was real believers intermixed with the error, and they were slowly weeding them out. Some people did not agree with the mixture as it was happening, and some of them went right along with it. But it's slightly what you see happening now, except in the reverse. There's intermixture as we're waking up, and there's more and more separation as we are coming to the truth and putting the error away from us. To continue here, it says, oh, I was down this way. I, I apologize. So that's pretty much a synopsis of the creation account and how there's a, the, parallel of, the parable of history up to the millennial reign in it. In Ezra right here, also in 2nd Baruch, in Genesis chapter 1, Yobelim chapter 2, there's a few different places in other in other books as well, excuse me. And then you also have the account in the recognitions of Clement. All of them help to explain and fill in the parable of what he's doing. If you remember when our Mashiach was walking, it says that he spoke to the multitudes in parables, and he did nothing without speaking in parables to them. In the Psalms, it talks about how he tells mysteries and parables from of old. And these things literally go all the way back to the beginning. 
I'll give you two more examples that you can look at and anyone else listening to this can look into to see that this is something that he does and it's not just in this way. The creation account is a parable of what will happen for the history until the millennial reign. In the book of Hanok, you have the um, animal apocalypse. I think it starts in the chapter 83. It's in the 80s of the book of Hanok, but it gives you in, in from creation until our, the coming of our Mashiach, everything that would happen, but everyone is given the form of different types of animals for who they are. And if you take that, that parable and then you look at the other writings, you'll find that it ties into them. You can find it literally following along, going all the way through, where Yishmael is called a wild donkey of a man, and he's a wild donkey in the parable. Edom is called a, a wild boar. And then in the book of Yobelim, Yaakov directly quotes and calls him like a wild boar rushing into the spear that was going to kill him by his behavior and what he was doing. And you can see that tracking the, the sheep and how they're delivered from the wolves and the different parallels there. It's all mentioned back in that, that one parable. Para, excuse me. It's mentioned in the animal apocalypse, that one parable, but you can see it in the other writings all over the place. In the very same way, you can look at the feasts like the Moedim and what you're supposed to be doing and you can trace different things that he's mentioning based on where you are based on his feast days through history. When Here's an example. When Gideon was having his dream uh, when he went to the camp to spy out the, the enemy and he overheard the dream correction and they talk about the barley sheaf rolling down that was like the time of first fruits early in his works towards his with his people but then when you had the giving of his ruach at the 15th of the third month that was the wheat harvest or the gathering in of the wheat and bringing the loaves in to present them and that's a theme that you can read in the epistles how he's the bread of life and we're we're to take the unleavened bread there's those same themes at the same times you can do that with all of these different parables in different ways you can see them playing out in the actual writings themselves as well also um, the dead sea scrolls in some of the peshars they explain them they just plainly say them and you can little by little see what he's trying to say but you the important thing and what i what i try to do is i take nothing from myself you can't just say, well, I think this means, or I try to comprehend it like so. It's what does it say? Where is that written? Any, any point you can pick on any, any particular verse, you prove it with scripture. You prove it with what's written. And if you don't know, you have to acknowledge that you don't know, because then he'll let you know. But if we just try to make stuff up, that is an assumption, and that's directly spoken against as a a work of the flesh and a carnal thing that we should put away from us because scripture is clear that we are to prove all things and hold fast to that which is good or tobe all right so to continue here or before i go on was there any questions i don't see any at the moment but if you have any questions go ahead All right, so no questions. I'll go ahead and continue. It says, all this have I spoken before you, Yahuwah, because you have said that it was for us that you created the firstborn world. As for the other nations, which also come of Adam, you have said that they are nothing, and they are as spittle, and have compared the abundance of them to as a drop that falls from a vessel. Now, I don't know if this is particular for every other people, including his people that were scattered at the time, because other than what was in the land, when Ezra was speaking, you had the multitude of the Yahudim still in dispersion. You had the, the entire northern kingdom still in dispersion. And the previous migrations before the exodus 
of those that intermixed with the Greece, the Grecians intermixed with those in Italy and became known as the Romans, went to Spain, went to Gaul, went to Britain, also Caledonia or what was called Scotland later on. Those were all peopled by his children, some of them walking in obedience to what they knew and being vessels unto value and some of them not. So this isn't a distinction that's against anyone or against all of his people and no one else, but like it, it counts those that are outside the land, but it does not count those who are not walking in obedience. They're considered of the nations when they're not doing his will. And you can see that in the Testament of the 12 patriarchs. I believe it was when Dan's children or maybe that was in the book of Yovelim, one of the two, but it shows Dan's children dying before they went to the land and they were all counted as of the nations. You also have in the book of Yovelim, um, Abraham's children from Keturah and also other than Yitzhak were considered of the nations because the covenant was not given to them. The Phoenicians that were right next to them were Hebrews, but the covenant was not given to them either. And by and large, they were walking in, in error and idolatry. So this part, for those that rejected him, this is what he says, and that's true for those that were of the seed, literal seed, and not. Because if you remember, Shaul explains it, that it is not all Yisrael that is Yisrael, but those who are circumcised in their heart, the ones that are grafted in, and the the truth never changes. It's just before it's revealed, it's not held against you. If you got, if you can recall that, just like Reuben, before the command was given for not doing what he did, he was not killed, but it's a death sentence. The same thing for the other things. Before it was given, it was not, the punishment was not exacted. Right here it says, and now, O Yahuwah, Behold, these nations which you have or which are been reputed as nothing have begun to be masters over us and to devour us. But we, your people, whom you have called your firstborn, your only begotten, which that would be Yechadi. It's or Yechidi, which is very similar to Yechad. The only difference is a yod in the middle. Yachad would be Yod, Cheth, Dalit, and Yachid is Yod, Cheth, Yod, Dalit. So when you have the working hand in the midst of it, it's your only beloved or your only begotten. But otherwise, it means to be united together into one. That word Yachad, again, is also used to, as the word for sharpening, like as iron sharpens iron. So a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. It says in the book of Proverbs. Here we go. It says, your only begotten and your fervent lover have been given into their hands. If the world has indeed been created for us, why do we not possess our world as an inheritance? How long shall this endure so? So he's asking, basically, if all the nations of the world are counted as nothing before you and only your nation is given any credence, why do we see these things happening the way they are? What's going on where these evil nations are prospering while his people are suffering? Right. So it does not look like there's any questions, but if you have any you can go ahead and unpause, otherwise I'll continue. All right. This says the response to Ezra's questions. Chapter 7. And when I had made an end of speaking these words, there was sent to me the Melech, which had been sent to me the former nights. And he said to me, Rise up, Ezra, and hear the words that I am come to tell you. And I said, speak on, Yahuwah. Then he said to me, 
There is a sea set in a wide expanse so that it is broad and vast, but it has an entrance set in a narrow place so that it is like a river. If anyone then desires to reach the sea, to look at it, to navigate it, and to rule it, how can he come to the broad part unless he passes through the narrow part? There is also another thing. A city is built and set upon a broad plain and is full of all tobe things. The entrance thereof is narrow and is set in a dangerous and precipitous place so that there is fire on the right hand and deep water on the left. And there is only one path between them both, that is, between the fire and the water, so small that there can only be one man walk thereon at a time. If this city now were given to a man for an inheritance, how shall he receive this inheritance unless he shall pass through the danger set before him? And I said, He cannot, O Yahuwah. Then said he to me, So also is Yisrael's portion, because for their sakes I made the world. And when Adam transgressed my statutes, then was decreed that now is done. And so the entrances of this world were made narrow and full of sorrow, toilsome and travail. They are but few and evil, full of dangers and involved in great hardships and very painful. But the entrances of the future world are broad and safe and really yield the fruit of immortality. Therefore, unless the living labor not to enter this straight and narrow way to pass through the difficult and vain experiences, they can never receive those things that have been laid up for them. That's just like running the race lawfully and running it in such a way that we can win. Or as our Mashiach describes, you have the narrow gate, the narrow way and the broad way, which also ties in with some of those anti-Mashiach for dummies videos. If you've seen it, if you haven't seen it yet, he gets to one part where he talks about the sixth letter, the wa in Hebrew, but it's the the upsilon or the epsilon in the Greek. And originally, it was made by drawing a thin downward stroke and a broad stroke off the side that went out at an angle. And it was actually, that letter was used by philosophers to, to discern that um, every man in his life has a way that they get to a, a crossroads. They can continue on the straight path or they can go off to the off to the right, the broad way off. One way led to destruction and one way was continuing on. But as you walk, as you continue to go, the two become farther and farther apart. And that parallel was what our Mashiach used when he was describing his narrow way and the broad way and tying those in together. It also has to do with the, um, in most cities in antiquity, you had the straight way also mentioned as the, the straight way is the street that Shaul was found on after he went to Damascus when he was blind. And that usually is the small, straight, narrow streets where the homes were. And then you had the Broadway, which was the main street with thoroughfares and traffic and lots of markets and, and where everyone did their conference and main businesses were done. The straight way led to the homes, but the Broadway led to you know, the big parts of the city, the comrades and the different things there. So it's another picture of the same concept there in a different manner. I thought that was really neat. That very letter and this very concept of difficult straits and persecution or the broad way that leads to destruction is typified for believers now in its use with Apollyon and what we have going on. The broad way is what everyone's following Sadly, following the um, Nicolaitan usurpation of the true belief and trying to find deliverance in the circus or church, which it's not to be found in. And for anyone interested in more information on those, I highly recommend 
the Antichrist. It's called For Dummies videos on YouTube from the channel called a Christmas is a lie.com. It does have some error and they use the wrong names, so you have to be mindful of that. But the information they share about Revelation is rather wonderful. It's horrible, but it's it's amazingly liberating. All right, to continue here. It says, now, therefore, why disquiet yourself, seeing that you are but a corruptible man? And why are you moved, seeing that you are mortal? Why have you not considered in your mind what thing is to come, rather than that which is now present? Then I answered and said, O Yahuwah that bears rule, behold, you have ordained in your Torah that the righteous should inherit these things, but that the chesedless wicked shall perish. Chesed is loving kindness. So this is the unloving wicked shall perish. Nevertheless, the righteous shall endure difficult circumstances while hoping for or expecting for easier ones. But they that have done wickedly have suffered the straight things and yet shall not see the easier ones. And he said to me, There is no judge above Yahuwah, and none that is more prudent and has comprehension above Elion, or the Most High. For there may be many that perish in this life or existence, because they despise the Torah of Yahuwah that is set before them. For Yahuwah has given strict commandment to those who came into the world, what they should do to exist, and what they should observe to avoid punishment. Nevertheless, they were not obedient to him, but spoke against him, and imagined vain thoughts, and deceived themselves by their wicked, fraudulent deeds. They even declared that the Most High Yahuwah does not exist, and they ignored his ways. But his Torah they have scorned and despised, and denied his covenants, and in his statutes they have been untrustworthy, and have not performed his works. Therefore, Ezra, empty things are for the empty, and full things for the full. And this should be a stark reminder for all of us that what he was going through here was a type and shadow of the same things we're going through now, but in a greater scale. We have those that are seeking to do what is true and those who are not. And it goes all the way back to what we can find in Revelation. He who is righteous, let him be more righteous. He who is wicked, let him be more wicked. He who is set apart, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, continue on in how you're doing. You're going to get the reward for what you're doing. But one thing I would like to point out here, it very clearly says that they were deceived by what they did. And in the apostolic constitutions, it makes it very clear, even Satan and the demons are deluded by their voluntary wickedness because they were willingly of their own volition evil and it was not of the, it was not forced upon them, but they chose to do wrong. They were put to a standard and they were judged for it. As someone does, it's done unto them. It's the same picture we can see played out in reality in the scriptures. We can see the same thing that's going to happen with the enemy. And that's how we can know, just like our Mashiach said after he came, the ruler of this world is judged. His, his time is done. His punishment is assured because of what already happened. It's his long suffering for our sake that it isn't being done yet so that all the elect, all the chosen will become believers. It's in his patience that he waits for us to do the right thing. But that means that everything's hinging on what believers do, and that's absolutely true and also lines up with the alphabet and the things that we'll cover as we go. But to continue here, just like the, just like the times we're living in with the French Revolution, they 
atheism that came about with it. They denied Yahuwah's existence even. But here we go. It says, For behold, the time shall come when the signs which I have foretold to you will come to pass, that the bride shall appear. Even the city which now is not seen shall be seen, and the Eretz which now is hidden shall be, shall be disclosed. And whosoever is delivered from the foresaid evils that I have foretold shall see my wonders. For my son, the Mashiach, shall be revealed with those that be with him, and they that remain shall rejoice within 400 years. From the time of Ezra, he had within 400 years, I think it was 390 or so, before the Mashiach was supposed to be there. I could be off on that 390. That was just a guess on my part. It says, after these years shall my son, Mashiach, die, and all men that have existence. They followed the shepherd everywhere he went. And the world shall be turned back to the primeval silence, the seventh yom, as it was at the first beginnings, so that no one shall remain. And after the seventh yom, the world that is not awake shall be raised up, and that which is corruptible shall perish and die. So this is going to be the millennial reign, and then this will be after the millennial reign, and Satan is released, and he does what he will, the great, what they call the great white throne arbitration or judgment, where the resurrection of the wicked is in all are judged according to what we've done. Which later on in this very writing, we'll read more about that. It says, And the earth shall restore those that are asleep in her, and the chamber shall give up the inner beings which have been committed to them. And the Most High shall be revealed upon the seat of arbitration. And then comes the end, and misery shall pass away, and the long-suffering shall have an end. But arbitration only shall remain. Truth shall stand, and belief shall grow strong. And the work shall follow, and the reward shall be manifested, and the righteous deeds shall be of force, and unrighteous wicked deeds shall bear no rule. Then the pit of torment shall appear, and opposite it shall be the place of rest, and the furnace of hell shall be disclosed, and opposite it the paradise of delight. Then the Most High Yahuwah will say to the nations that have been raised from the dead, Look now and comprehend whom you have denied, whom you have not served, whose commandments you have despised. Look on this side and on that. Here are delight and rest, and there are fire and torments. Thus he will speak to them on the yom of arbitration, a yom that has no sun or moon or stars, or cloud or thunder or lightning or wind or water or air or darkness or evening or dawn or summer, or spring, or heat, or winter, or storm, or frost, or cold, or hail, or rain, or dew, or noon, or midnight, or dawn, or shining, or brightness, or light, but only the splendor of the splendor of the Most High Yahuwah, by which all shall see what has been determined for them. For it will last for about a week of years. This is my arbitration, and it is prescribed, or and its prescribed order, and to you alone have I shown these things. So right there you can see that the great white throne arbitration, or the Yom of Judgment, as they call it, will take a week of years at least, where there's not going to be 
anything else after Satan has been released and done his thing and the father says enough is enough because he alone holds the appointment of all these things. The Mashiach himself admitted he does not know that the Yom or hour, just like we don't, but it's given to the father alone. Um, after he's destroyed everything by fire and it's only his, his presence that we behold and everyone's resurrected and everything's desolate, that's when he gives the great white throne judgment or his arbitration. And then after that time is the forever after of unspeakable tobe things that will never fade. No more tears, no sadness, no sleep, no night, no darkness. But um, that's the, the time that we should all long for, to look for, and to love. Before we continue, it looks like we have a couple questions. It says, so when he says, my son, he is referring to him as Mashiach because this Melech is the pre-incarnate Yahuwah, Yahushua. The, the Mashiach, or the, uh, the Melech, the messenger that was appearing to him was Oriel. So he, he mentioned earlier that the messenger that had been want to come to him is the one that returned here. And Oriel, the same one that is given authority over the luminaries, the same one that was speaking with Hanok to show him all the different luminaries, he's the one that is speaking to Ezra currently. But at one point, our Mashiach does show up to him and starts speaking to him. And that's when he's looking at him, he starts recognizing it. So we will see that. Okay, because he keeps calling him Yehovah. And I was wondering about that. Our Mashiach does that as well uh, on occasion too. He'll make distinction between the father and himself when he's speaking to Moshe in the book of Yobelin. But he'll also say like, the word of Yahuwah came to Abraham through me. And I said, because you have done this, and he, he's saying, because you will not withhold your, your son, your only son from me. And that was our Mashiach speaking to him. So he, he does that as well. Sometimes he'll speak in his own person about the father. Sometimes he'll speak like the father speaking through him in first person. And sometimes he'll speak like the Ruach saying things. And the, you can see the difference in the scripture, but it's usually so when expressed. Ezra, when Ezra is addressing him as Yoa, he's actually addressing the angel, or uh, sorry, the messenger. No, he's addressing our creator. It's the messenger that's responding to him. Okay. So the messenger is a on this one. Train. Yes. And you we have to keep in mind too, what we have is an English translation of a Hebrew text that's thousands of years old. We might not have the best translation or the most accurate version. So if there's little things that seem inconsistent between him calling a messenger or speaking to Yahuwah and then having a messenger answer him. It might be, be sorry about that, but it might be, um, that might be the reason it's a translation issue and not so much because of what was actually there. I'm sorry. I have to pause real quick. Sorry about that. To sum up what we were just saying though, it could be the translation. It, it could be something that we're missing in that regard but right here we had he's addressing yahuwah but it was the messenger that came to him before that's speaking with him later on it will be our mashiach and he'll realize that it could be something that we're missing like i said with that or it could be something else that we'll see later on but it's not something we have to be overly dogmatic about what we can know for certain is that our Mashiach was pre-existent from the beginning. He's the one mediator between Elohim and men. Anytime man has seen Elohim, it's always been our Mashiach. That, that's, the, that's the fact. Yes. Kepha says very clearly in the recognitions of Clement, 
that our Mashiach was always with the obedient and the righteous, and he appeared to them when they needed it in different times and in different ways. So th this same is true for right here as well, and you can see it over and over again. Another place where you can see that our Mashiach is actually there, but you don't get the context until he came in the Renewed Covenant writings, was in the book of Daniel. When he is having his vision, and the one tells him to stand up and gives him strength by saying, be strong, and he's strong, and he says, oh, you know, he's, you're speaking to me, and what you say is, you know, happening, it's exactly like what our Mashiach does when he came, and he's speaking with authority, and it's an amazing thing, but most people completely overlook who he's actually talking to there. So it's the same thing here. You can find our Mashiach all over the place, but he doesn't go out and directly say, oh, that was him, because he was hidden. It was, it was kept secret. And if you remember the book of Gad, Gad's vision, he was revealed, the Mashiach revealed himself to Gad. And when Dawid heard the vision that he had, he said, you're, you're prosperous because he's made himself known to you. And Gad clearly knew the distinction between Yahuwah the Father, his word, and the Ruach after having that vision. So it's rather neat. These are just confirmation. It's just it's neat and we can see confirmations of these things again and again so that we don't have to guess, we don't have to worry or struggle to try to figure it out because it's literally the truth doesn't change and it just again and again you'll see that. And my second question, could you um, elaborate on that? Yes, ma'am, I was just about to read it. Okay. Your next question says, is there ever a time when it is appropriate to use the word understand or is it always comprehend? Whenever it's about our Mashiach's opinion or with his will and the Father's will, it's, a, it, it's good to be comprehending and understand that because you, we are under his jurisdiction. We're beneath him. It, it's under his shadow of his wings that we want to stand. Right. So it's always about him. Whenever it's about him, about the truth, we want to understand. We want to be in the position of submissive acknowledgement of what is real. And to comprehend it, it's the same fashion. But you don't want to submit or understand something that is not of him. Just for the context of these words, I personally don't have an issue. It's not about myself or how I feel about things. But all the way back in the times of the philosophers of the Greeks, you had Sogoliisms and so uh, the wordplay, the trickery that they used, trying to have fancy words with special definitions and being clever in how they pronounce things or what they're saying to trip people up where they can't even know what the meanings of words are and they're using that against you for their own advantage. That stuff happened with Greek philosophy and, and is carrying down even to this day or this yom, with words like understand, which they claim is to be putting yourself under the jurisdiction of something. And then also, it, it, it ties into how the root, the roots of the words, what it actually means. These things are real. I'm so they understand, or they, they comprehend it, and oh, they yes. know what they're doing. And they're kind of mocking you because you don't know. Absolutely. And they do that with a variety of stuff. The word human, for example, is a, yeah. the natural man that's not able to receive the root, the things of the Ruach. Yes. Or they do that with the word for a Christian. If you look up the etymology of a Cretan. Yeah, Cretan. Right. It, it's Christianos. They mock right. us with these things. And none of that stuff was original with the belief. All of it was added by these, the Nicolaitan usurping anti-Mashiach entity that has been working in the sons of disobedience. Yeah. So it's, it's superior games or false superior games. Yeah. So it, there's quite a few of those things that they do. And if you ever looked at like the, they talk about spellcraft in English with a weekend, weekdays, and different things like that. That's another thing they do with wordplay but it's more pronounced with um, law in America. That's where they really get tricky. And if you realize that the law is only applicable to 
wicked individuals that are not moral. Literally, no statute in this country has jurisdiction over a moral man or a man in general. It's a human or a natural man, what they call the, the citizen, that they make liable to all these statutes because a man is protected by his creator's rights enumerated in the Constitution in this country. But they get you on wordplay. They get you to give up your rights by consent. That's a separate issue. Mm. It is the same thing. It's just carrying along from that, that error that started with the Greek philosophers. They kept it on. They just perfect it. In Jesuitism, it's called equivocation and mental reservation with Segoliisms and Sophiisms, the things that they use to trip people up and trick them. But to continue here, was that sufficient yes. for your question? Okay. Thank you. No problem. Our daughter. Low to bar. All right. So continuing on with um, chapter seven here, verse 45. The remnant, the, the small number. If you're familiar with the, have you ever read the Caldonian history yet? The ancient history of Caldonia? Bits and pieces of it. All right. Well, if you happen to. Depth. All right. If you happen to read that, I mean, just as a story, you'll see that over and over again, he delivers the remnant. He protects those that love him. They don't see any harm or calamity. They're, they're kept, they're, the prayers are answered, and they were actually in a happy and restful state for a long time until they went apostate to what they knew to do. So it's a wonderful witness to his words being true and that he always, he always looks out for those that love him. All right, but he says, I answered and said, O oh, sovereign Yahuwah, I said then, and I say now, prosperous are those who are alive and keep your commandments. But what of those for whom I prayed? For who among the living is there that has not sinned? Or who among men that has not transgressed your covenant? And now I see that the world to come will bring delight to few, but torments to many. For an evil heart has grown up in us, which has alienated us from you, Yahuwah, and has brought us into corruption and the ways of death, and has shown us the paths of perdition and removed us far from existence, and that not just a few of us, but almost all who have been created. And just to recap, he did not have our Mashiach's words they didn't have the reconciliation for intentional sin. You can read throughout the entire, re, re, the entire covenant. You can even go in the Dead Sea Scrolls as far as I'm aware, and you won't find a single offering for intentional sin, for, for malicious, for intentional evil. But our Mashiach forgives us. For him, there's... A, some things are eternal. You blaspheme the Ruach. There's no forgiveness in this existence or the, or the next. Certain things require death. And when you come to him, those are exacted of you. But not everything is. The things that he forgives. All right, there's a difference. I don't know, I don't know if you're aware, but there's three different words for what sin is in the scriptures. Are you familiar with the distinction? There is um, the word for sin is chata, chet, tet, aleph, or chet, tet, aleph, he. And that's the general word sin. If you think about um, chet is like a perimeter or an enclosure, the fence, right? The tet is like a seal. And then the aleph is the the, the principal thing when we sin it's our it's our mashiach that was buried in the tomb with the, the seal rolled in front of it and that's literally the picture of what you can see in the word sin there but that's generally for sin and that's what happens when we kill him when we sin 
It's the reason why he had to die. The other words are transgression and inequity is how they translate it. The word for inequity is they say avon or awon, and that's ayin, wa, noon. Ayin yod noon is the word for ayin, or what is the visible surface, what you perceive. It's also to investigate or search, right? So avon and ayin are very similar. It ties into the inequity is what we bear or he will bear our inequities when we come to him. But when we continue in them, which is intentional sin, intentionally doing the wrong thing, we bear our inequities. Certain sins are inequities and certain ones are not. There's a distinction in there. And then the last one is the word for transgressions, which is literally pe sha, pe sheen ayin. And when you transgress, it's like breaking trust. When you have a covenant with someone or an agreement between two parties, you break the trust by not doing the agreement. When you have neighbors, you break their trust by doing things that are unneighborly. That's the sense of that. But pesha is literally the, like a mouth, pe, and then sheen, ayin is the word for deliverance or salvation. The pay also means to open. So when you transgress, you're opening yourself up to be in need of deliverance. That's, that's what that word is playing out to. But there's different concepts behind them. Chata is just sin. Pesha is transgressing or breaking trust. And then awa or avan is inequity. And they each have a different thing. Here, Malicious sin or certain sins were not, there, there was no appropriation for them. If a man was clean and he chose not to keep the feast, there's no excuse for that. He's cut off from the people. Right? If a man committed treason, this is when they're in the land having to keep the extra bonds, but the death sentence that was established, these, these are things that I was talking about. Now, we're not to go out and kill anyone right away. He's giving us leave for repentance. If you remember in the apostolic constitutions, an overseer is to go out of their way and to do everything within their absolute limits of what they're possible for them to do to try to deliver and rescue those that are wayward. Not to, not to cut them off and cast them away at the first provocation, but to bend over backwards, to take abuses, to be long-suffering, to beg their reconciliation. And when it's not possible, when they're like gangrene or dead flesh that's corrupting the stuff around it, and there's no remedy but to cut it off, that's when you separate them from the body. So it's not to be, it's not to be uh, very quick or harsh in our judgment because these things are eternal. When someone's outside of covenant with our maker, when they're not fellowshipping with the assembly, when they're not immersed in his name and taking communion and doing the things that he enjoined for believers to do, you're not vouchsafed eternal life. If you're not living the life of an instructed, if you can't do otherwise, you're not his. There's no other way around that. You can fake it. You can know all the information you want, but you actually have to do what he said to love him. And if you don't obey, the wrath of Elohim remains on you. Very simple. But these things have been confused a great deal by, as we've been learning, the Nicolaitan usurpers for the belief that crept in shortly before and during the time of Constantine. Yet, when they were out in the desert, um... Punishment came very quickly. Are you talking about in the wilderness? Yeah. Oh, yeah. To, to teach them. And that, that same thing's happening now, too. The, the parallel, if you remember, how far have you gotten in those videos? I'm not certain because I'm trying I've to... been through them once. I'm going through them again. All right. I've Jeanette. only um, 
like I, I think I might be to 30, but I'm not sure. But I've been going over them, some of them more than twice. All right. If they've got a whole lot of information, uh, I've gone over them several times. And I, after I finish all of them, I'm going to go back over all of them again because there's just so much there. And it's so um, opposite of what we've been taught our whole lives. <laughs> and it's just, it, but I love watching them. I've been, exactly. I've been putting them on because I can get them loud enough that I can put them on while I'm working, as long as I'm not running water or something like that. I've been putting them on all the time and just listening to them while I'm working. All right. It's so, just fascinating to me that it's so different than what we've been taught. Right. Mm -hmm. But you can see the parallels in here then because the, the wilderness journey it was a foreshadow. If you remember in the book of Yob Elim, after, if, if, if you've read it, at the end of it, he says he's given him all of what would happen until he comes to dwell with men. And if you look from creation to Moshe on the mountain, and then the 40-year wandering, and then coming into the land, that is a type and shadow of all he would do until bringing them into the millennial reign. Because Yahushua going into the land was a type of our Mashiach returning and getting ready for the millennial reign type situation. Um, during the wilderness time, that was a time where it was before he brings them into the land, but after they've received the covenant. And it was at that time they were being punished for the things they were rebelling against Moshe and usurping the proper established things to do. In that same vein, what we have going on now after he came, he said, now that I've come, there's no excuse. And if you remember, it's almost immediately after things happen, he was punishing even after he came and Herod Agrippa did not deny when someone was saying, ooh, it's like the voice of a mighty one. If you remember in Acts, he didn't deny it. And all of a sudden he rotted with worms and died. He was punished immediately. It, he didn't die immediately. In Josephus, it, it lets you know he survived for about five days and then died. But he was in pain, infested with worms because he had heard someone claim him to be like a mighty one after a Mashiach came, after he knew all those things that had happened, and he didn't deny it. In that same way, Vespasian and the Nicolaitans, with what they were doing, he claimed to be a mighty one. He claimed to be the Mashiach, started wiping out believers. They establish their error, and he goes to reinstitute the um, temple for the Caesars to worship, to worship himself as a as a mighty one and within 10 years he's dead in a humiliating way and that temple he had dedicated destroyed along with the same number of people or sorry um a fourth part he took a fourth of what was done in the land and he times it by four with what he did to rome itself with the explosion of that volcano and then when, what they did at Antioch punished that as well. And it wasn't just once, but it was a warning and then destruction. Water, then fire. In the same ways they sinned, he turned it against them. Just like he punished the Mitzrayim for their mighty ones, he was punishing the error they were bringing in, Rome was, by their mighty ones. Both the Triton of men for the Triads and the Trinity and the Tritons, Kronos and the time for keeping Saturnalia, Apollos and the, the sun worship, every time they established, or Apollyanos, the, the, the destroyer, right? But every time they established some error and made it enforced, there was a, a calamity that came about, especially in this country. Um, they were tracking it even when Grant made the uh, X mass official federal law in this country, that's when the blood tides started appearing here in mass, right? And, that, and then the same vein with continuing the perpetration of these things, the, um, the sun scorching men with fierce heat and the skin cancer was a plague that started around the 1800s for a very response for these things. So it's the same thing you see what happened in the wilderness then punishing the children for their rebellion against Moshe 
is happening for us in this wilderness time now as well in a larger scale. But that's also the benefit of reading these things and learning how, as we go because you can see the patterns and it's literally consistent. It's always the same. He doesn't change. If anything seems like it's different, that's usually because that's error that they brought in. But here we go. Chapter 7, verse 49. It says, And he answered me and said, Listen to me, Ezra, and I will instruct you and will admonish you yet again. For this reason, the Most High Yahuwah has made not one world, but two. This world that we live in, the place of combat to righteousness, and then the world to come in which there's no tears, if you're righteous, or the torments of unquenchable fire and undying worms, if you're wicked. It says, for whereas you have said that the righteous are not many but are few, while the chesedless wicked abound, hear the explanation for this. If you have just a few precious stones, will you add to them lead and clay? Then I said, O Yahuwah, how could that be? And he said to me, Not only that, but ask the Eretz, and she will tell you. Defer to her, and she will declare to you. Say to her, You produce gold and silver and copper, and also iron and lead and clay. But silver is more abundant than gold, and copper than silver, and iron than copper, and lead than iron, and clay than lead. Judge, therefore, which things are precious and desirable, those that are abundant or those that are rare. I said, Sovereign Yahuwah, what is plentiful is of less worth, for what is more rare is more precious. He answered me and said, Weigh within yourself what you have thought. For he who has what is hard to get rejoices more than he who has what is plentiful. So also will be the arbitration which I have promised. For I will rejoice over the few who shall be delivered, because it is they who have made my splendor to prevail now, and through them my name has been made honor or has been honored. And I will not grieve over the multitude of those who perish, for it is they who are now like a mist and are similar to a flame and smoke. They are set on fire and burn hotly and are extinguished. I replied and said, O Eretz or earth, what have you brought forth if the mind is made out of the dust like the other created things? For it would have been better if the dust itself had not been born, so that the mind might not have been made from it. But now the mind grows with us, and therefore we are tormented, because we perish and know it. Let the race of man lament, and let the beasts of the field be glad. Let all who have been born lament, but let the four-footed beasts and the flocks rejoice. For it is much better with them than with us, for they do not look for the arbitration, nor do they know of any torment nor deliverance promised to them after death. For what does it profit us that we shall be preserved alive, but cruelly tormented? A lot of individual, a lot of believers today, or they, they won't necessarily believe that the inner being of a man is immortal. And they think that when you die, you sleep or you're, you cease to be. But that's something that's nowhere actually written. It's taken as the euphemism of sleep for death. And they make it seem literal. But the actual evidence, both here, later on in this very writing, and all over the place in many other writings, specifically and implicitly, it, it has to be that the inner being is immortal and that they prove it through reason and what's written. But they basically say, if 
man was not made to suffer the things that they do in this existence, it would be unrighteous of our creator not to punish everyone in this existence while they live. And you see evil reigning and doing well and living long and dying in peace and being given great honors in their burials. When the righteous are cruelly mistreated, abused, lose everything, die ignobly, and aren't taken care of after death. It, it, it proves to any reasonable mind that there is a future arbitration and that there is a righteous end to all these things. But Kepha explains it a lot better than I can. And he, over and over again, you'll, you'll see this, including as we read along, but they make it very clear the inner being of a man predates his arrival in his body. We were actually created. All the inner beings, the souls, the Ruach Oath, everything was created in the first Yom. And it was all the sons of Elohim shouting for joy and singing his praises after watching or perceiving his works on that Yom. is mentioned in the book of Yob. It's mentioned in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And... Um, or it might be mentioned elsewhere, but it's also mentioned in the book of Yobelim in the chapter 2 when it's talking about the first Yom of creation. And in there, it, that includes all the sons of Elohim, not just those that were like messengers, but all of the ones that would ever be his children. To continue, it says, For all who have been born are involved in inequities and are full of sins and are burdened with transgressions. Well, I'm glad we just covered those three, so now you know the difference between them. And there's more involved with that. I'm going to be doing an in-depth study myself, but I've been looking into that a little bit, so I wanted to share. And if we were not to come into arbitration after death, perhaps it would have been better for us. He answered me and said, when the Most High Yahuwah made the world and Adam and all who have come from him, he first prepared the arbitration and the things that pertain to the arbitration. And now comprehend from your own words, for you have said that the mind grows with us. For this reason, therefore, those who dwell on the Eretz shall be tormented, because though they had comprehension, they committed inequity, and though they received the commandments, they did not keep them, and though they obtained the Torah, they dealt untrustworthily with what they received. What then will they have to say in the arbitration, or how will they answer in the last times? For how long the time is that the Most High Yahuwah has been patient with those who inhabit the world? And not for their sake, but for the sake, or but because of the times which he has foreordained. All right. And this part is going to get on to the, the state of the departed. Before we continue, it's 1236, so we have a little bit of time. Did you want to read this one, or did you want have any questions before we stop? This one's a little long. So it might take a moment, but we can read through it if you'd prefer. Or if you have questions, you can ask them. All right, well, we'll go ahead and continue. Unless you have a question, then you can stop me, okay? This is the state of the departed before the arbitration yom. And this is going to repeat what I was just saying he was going to mention later. I answered and said, if I have found favor in your sight, my master, show this also to your servant, whether after death, as soon as every one of us yields up his ruach, or sorry, his inner being, his nefesh, we shall be kept in rest until those times come, when you will renew the creation, or whether we shall be tormented at once. And he answered me and said, I will show you that also, but do not be associated with those who have shown scorn, nor number yourself among those who are tormented. For you have a treasure of works laid up with the Most High Yahuwah, 
but it will not be shown to you until the last time. Now concerning death, the teaching is, when the decisive decree has gone forth from the Most High Yahuwah that a man shall die, as the Ruach leaves the body and returns again to him who gave it, first of all, it adores the splendor of the Most High Yahuwah. It says a Ruach right here, but that might be the word for Nefesh again because it's the inner being of a man that's doing that. The Ruach gives life or existence. But it's our consciousness is in our nefesh. All right, so first of all, he adores the splendor of the Most High, Yahuwah. And if it is one of those who have shown scorn and have not kept the way of the Most High, Yahuwah, and who have despised his Torah, and who have hated those who fear Yahuwah, such ruachim, or spirits as they call it, shall not enter into habitations, but shall immediately wander about in torments, ever grieving and sad in seven ways. The first way, because they have scorned the Torah of the Most High. The second, way because they cannot now make a tove repentance that they might exist the third way they shall see the reward laid up for those who have trusted the covenants of the most high yahuwah the fourth way they shall consider the torment laid up for themselves in the last yom the fifth way they shall see how the habitations of the others are guarded by Melakim in profound quiet. The sixth way, they shall see how some of them will pass over into torments. The seventh way, which is worse than all the ways that have been mentioned, because they shall utterly waste away in confusion and be consumed with shame and shall wither with fear at seeing the splendor of the Most High Yahuwah, before whom they sinned while they were alive, and before whom they are to be judged in the last time. Now, it doesn't distinctly mention it here, but it does mention in the book of Hanok and some other places, there are different levels of, everyone gets according to what they deserve. Those who are here in the place of torment or next to the lake of fire, but they did not do things, they didn't blaspheme or they weren't reviling our maker, they're not necessarily suffering any torments physically or in their being other than the fact of what they have to, to look forward to, in which case, if they repent, if they mourn, if they're remorseful, if they've suffered during this time, they have an expectation at the great throne arbitration for eternity of well-being instead of the contrary. It, it, it depends on your works, but everyone who's there, everyone who's done things, there, there's, there's different levels for what you're going to get, including punishments, both when you first die and after you're thrown into the lake of fire. Not everyone suffers in the same way. Some men, and I'll give you examples, Antiochus Epiphans, he willingly tortured innocents, even when he was warned about the consequences, and he went down into the grave suffering, and he was going to be suffering torments forever because of what he did. He was told that. It mentions in the book of Hanok that if you blasphemers, those that, those that do certain things like that, and they die in it, will be tormented. They'll be suffering without rest as soon as they die whether it's being confounded for knowing for certain what's going to happen or physical being close to the place and physically suffering it's reminiscent of both it's also mentioned in josephus's discourse to the greeks on hades of the similar thing but not everyone that dies is going to be over there in the same situation However, everyone that's in rest, everyone that's his, is in profound quiet and rest, and they all are of unity, sharing a like situation, 
until their reward. So there is that distinction. But we'll continue. This is also the seven ways of those that have kept the ways of Yahuwah. Okay? He says, now this is the order of those who have kept the ways of the Most High Yahuwah when they shall be separated from their corruptible body. During the time that they decayed in it, they laboriously served the Most High and withstood danger every hour that they might keep the Torah of the Torah giver perfectly. Therefore, this is the teaching concerning them. First of all, they shall see with great joy the splendor of him who receives them, for they shall have rest in seven orders. The first order, because they have striven with great effort to overcome evil which was formed with them, that it might not lead them astray from existence into death. The second order, because they see the perplexity in which the inner beings of the unloving or the unmerciful, the chesedless, wander and the punishment that awaits them. The third order, they see the witness which he who formed them bears concerning them, that while they were existing, they kept the Torah which was given them in trust. The fourth order, they comprehend the rest which they now enjoy, being gathered into their chambers and guarded by Melachim in profound quiet, and the splendor which awaits them in the last yom. The fifth order, they rejoice that they have now escaped what is mortal and shall inherit what is to come. And besides, they see the straits and the fullness of toil from which they have been delivered and the spacious liberty which they are to receive and enjoy in immortality. The sixth order, when it is shown to them how their face is to shine like the sun and how they are to be made like the light of the stars, being incorruptible from then on. The seventh order, which is greater than all that have been mentioned, because they shall rejoice with boldness and shall be confident without confusion and shall be glad without fear. For they hastened to behold the face of him whom they served in existence and from whom they are to receive their reward when magnified. This is the order of the inner beings of the righteous, as henceforth is announced, and the aforesaid are the ways of torment, which those who would not give heed shall suffer hereafter. I answered and said, Will time therefore be given to the inner beings after they have been separated from the bodies to see what you have described to me? He said to me, they shall have freedom for seven yamim, so that during these seven yamim they shall see the things of which you have been told, and afterward they shall be gathered in their habitations. All right, that was a long one. Or that was usually a lot of meat there. But is there any questions or comments? It's very clear. It, there's no actual physical torment mentioned. You're not being thrown in the lake of fire after you die if you're wicked. But it's the idea of what the reality of what you've done and what's in store for you that's confounding and that's tormenting you for the most part. Was there any other comments or questions before we continue? It looks like... We might stop there, but I might finish because this part is a lamentation that goes with the rest. So I'll go ahead and read this one. It's kind of, it goes with it. and It's better to finish it off on this one to start next week with it. It says, may the righteous intercede for the chesedless. I answered and said, if I have found favor in your sight, show further to me your servant whether the yom of arbitration, the righteous will be able to intercede for the chesedless or to entreat Elion Yahuwah for them. 
fathers for sons or sons for parents, brothers for brothers, relatives for their kinsmen, or friends for those who are most dear. He answered me and said, Since you have found favor in my sight, I will show you this also. The yom of arbitration is decisive and displays to all the seal of truth. Just as now a father does not send his son, or a son his father, or a master his servant, or a friend his dearest friend, to be ill or sleep or eat or be healed in his stead. So no one shall be able to pray for another on that yom. Neither shall any one lay a burden on another. For then everyone shall bear his own righteousness or unrighteousness. And this is the context for when Shaul is speaking. And he says, bear one another's burdens and help each other while we are exist in this existence, right? Because everyone's going to bear their own burden when we're all held to account for it. So hopefully that makes more sense. Then I answered and said, how then do we find that first Abraham prayed to the, for the people of Sodom and Moshe for our fathers who sinned in the desert? And Yahushua ben Nun after him for Yisrael in the days of Achan and Shemuel in the Yamim of Shaul and Dawid for the plague and Shalomo for those in the sanctuary or set apart place and Eliyahu for those who received the rain and for the one who was dead that he might exist and Hezkiyahu for the people in the Yamim of Sennacherib and many others prayed for many. Therefore, the righteous have prayed for the chesedless now, when corruption has increased and unrighteousness has multiplied. Why will it not be so then as well? He answered me and said, This present world is not the end. The full splendor does not abide in it. Therefore, those who are strong prayed for the weak. But the yom of arbitration will be the end of this age and the beginning of the immortal age to come, in which corruption has passed away. Sinful indulgence has come to an end, unbelief has been cut off, and righteousness has increased and truth has appeared. Therefore, no one will then be able to have loving kindness on him who has been condemned in the yom of arbitration or to overwhelm him, to harm him, who is victorious. And the lamentation over the fate of the mass of mankind. I answered and said, This is my first and last word. It would have been better if the Eretz had not produced Adam, or else when it had produced him, had restrained him from sinning. For what tobe is it to all that they exist in sorrow now, and expect punishment after death. O oh Adam, what have you done? For though it was you who sinned, the fall was not yours alone, but ours also who are your descendants. For what tobe is it to us if an eternal age has been promised to us, but we have done deeds that bring death? And what tobe is it that an everlasting expectation has been promised us, but we have miserably failed. Or that safe and healthful habitations have been reserved for us, but we have lived wickedly. Or that the splendor of the Most High Yahuwah will defend those who have led a pure existence, but we have walked in the most wicked ways. Or that a paradise shall be revealed, whose fruit remains unspoiled, and in which are abundance and healing, but we shall not enter into it. Because we have lived unseemly, or er, because we have lived in unseemly places, or that the faces of those who practice self-control shall shine more than the stars, but our faces shall be blacker than darkness. 
For while we existed and committed inequity, we did not consider what we should suffer after death. He answered and said, This is the meaning of the contest which every man who is born on Eretz shall wage, that if he is defeated he shall suffer what you have said, but if he is victorious he shall receive what I have said. For this is the way of which Moshe, while he was existing, spoke to the people, saying, Choose for yourself existence, that you may exist. But they did not believe him, nor the foretellers after him, nor even myself who have spoken to them. Therefore there shall not be grief at their damnation, so and so much joy over those to whom deliverance is assured. All right, and right here you can see him speaking in the person of our Mashiach again. So it could be a translation issue, one who was speaking at the time, or that messenger that was coming to him may have been the Mashiach at this point. I'd have to go back over and check again, but it seems to be the way that you were mentioning. So I could have been mistaken when I said that earlier. Anyways, that was probably a good place for us to pause. He goes on to enumerate his attributes of of our of Yahuwah and then asking him petition. But again, the whole issue that Ezra is having is because he has not experienced the truth of our Mashiach yet. He does not know that there's expectation for those who turn from their sins and do right. Even though it's mentioned in Ezekiel, he might not have that writing. But what he doesn't have also is sacrifices for these things that he knows that people have committed. So if you've intentionally done evil, and it's for those who have lived without sin or walking in righteousness that are the world to come is an expectation for, that's the part he's having a hard time with. But it's later explained, and he continues to get um, the revelation from Armor and Shiok about it as we go. Eventually, though, he tells him, stop worrying about these things and start asking about what's to come because that's what he wants to focus on. <laughs> so kind of like um, if you remember in the Shepherd of Hermas when he's giving him the information, he says, oh, hey, you didn't ask about this one. And he goes, oh, yeah, let me, let me hear about that one too. So he kind of fills it in for him. It's the same thing with Ezra. He goes, well, go ahead and ask about these things. Don't worry about that. And then he directs him where he wants to start focusing his attention so that he can do what he wanted with the revelation. It's an interesting phenomenon that I've seen in a few places. That's just two of them. That being said, was there any comments or questions before we close off the recording and say prayers? I don't have any. All right. Nor do I. All right. Well, then. Uh, Thank you for everyone participating, and thank you, ladies, for always being with me and having the pleasure of doing this together. Have a wonderful Shabbat, everyone, and we will see you again next week, Father willing.